Welcome to Success Talks with Rodney Salisbury. I hope you will support my sponsors who bring you this podcast absolutely free and with limited interruptions. I really appreciate you taking the time to listen. I'll get started in just a second. The reviews are in. The latest book from voiceover superstar and coach Rodney Salisbury is another runaway hit. Readers from all over the world are raving about his newest title, Tongue Twisters and Vocal Warmups. You can find this and his other titles at the top of the voiceover bestsellers list on Amazon.com. I'm sitting here today with one of the smartest people in Hollywood, in my opinion, one of the brightest guys. This man is a writer, he's a story editor, he's a producer, and he's been doing this for over 35 years, all right? Primarily focusing on animation and children's television. If you like animated action adventure, you have to see his Fox series, Spider-Man, the Animated Series. If you're into watching preschool programming, you got to see his work on PBS, the animated series, J.J. the Jet Plane. And if you like movies, I will never forget his feature film, Class Act. He also has worked for such diverse companies as Disney Studio, Warner Brothers, Animation, and Hanna-Barbera Productions. And he's worked with people like Jim Henson, George Lucas, Stan Lee, Rob Minkoff, and many, many others. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming my good friend, John Semper Jr. Hello, Rodney. Thanks for having me on. This is great. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. I really, really do appreciate it. Welcome to Success Talks. I started this thing because I was really into letting people know about success. And I told them in my preview podcast that not only would I be talking to regular people, famous people, but I would also be talking to my good friends who are successful. And that's you, John. So I would like you to first tell us how you got started. Well, first of all, I'm very proud of being your good friend because I have nothing but admiration for everything you've done and who you are and the way that you've conducted your life. So that's one of my biggest achievements is being a friend of yours. Thank you. Um, how did I get started? Uh, well, as a kid, uh, if you had asked me when I was age five or six or seven what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said, I want to be a, a cartoonist. I want to make animated cartoons. Mm -hmm. So that's really how it started, was being very, um, very uh, excited about Walt Disney animation and Walt Disney animated movies. And uh, the, the one movie that I remember being a big influence on me was Sleeping Beauty. Hmm. Because um, the fact that there was this gigantic widescreen technicolor mm -hmm. motion picture, and especially the end when Prince Philip fought the, drag the dragon, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that that all came from people drawing, you know, that every frame was, was synthesized, you mm -hmm. know, and it, none of it was real. I, I just thought that was the most amazing magic ever. So throughout my life, I was always interested in film. Um, my uh, mother and father uh, uh, bought me uh, eight millimeter projectors, mm. and, and uh, my mother bought me little little fifty foot eight millimeter and super eight millimeter films, mm -hmm. and then eventually bought me a camera, and I was making little films, mm -hmm. and I was taking classes in little film, you know, in filmmaking when they first started doing that. Uh, so that's really how it all started for me, was just being a kid interested in movies. My interest in animation segued over to my interest in live action film in general. Okay. And then um, when I went to college, I, I, I went to Harvard. I graduated from the Visual and Environmental Studies Department. And Harvard wasn't really very committed to teaching film. Mm -hmm. So you still had to do an awful lot on your own. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as a kid, I got jobs working in movie theaters. I worked for the biggest theater chain in Boston, Massachusetts, which is where I'm from, mm -hmm. which at that time was called SAC theaters. And I started working there when I was 15 and, and, uh, and, and rose to become a theater manager. And then I also worked for a very famous counterculture uh, sort of uh, theater in, uh, in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was called the Orson Welles Cinema. Ah. And yes, I did eventually get to meet Orson Welles. Good for you. Uh, and so I was very immersed in the whole cinema thing in the 1970s in, in particular. Beautiful. Um, when, when movies were really happening. Right. Yeah. Now, here you were immersed, and your parents bought you the camera, and you were making these movies, and yep. you continued it on through college. Yeah. But then you started to do 
this thing that I think you do so great. You started to write. Yeah. And so I want to know, do you think a person who wants to write, when we think about our listening audience out there, mm -hmm. do you think a person who wants to write has to go to school for writing? Um, I think that there are some wonderful schools and some wonderful courses. Uh, I, I, I've lectured at a couple of schools. I most recently lectured at Ball State University in, uh, in Indiana. Mm -hmm. um, when I started all of this, that wasn't an option. There really weren't very many courses being taught in film writing because it was not considered a legitimate profession. Really? Yeah, it really wasn't. Um, you know, media was was new and non-traditional, and mm -hmm. so schools were not teaching it. Uh, and so I've never taken really a writing class in my life, uh, a, a formal writing class. Um, I did briefly out here study with Danny Simon, who mm -hmm. was the brother of Neil Simon. Wow. Danny taught Neil how to write, and he, um, he also worked with people like Woody Allen, and, and Danny was a, a TV showrunner for many years. He uh, was one of the showrunners on Facts of Life, and mm -hmm. he did a lot of sitcoms and stuff. Danny didn't so much teach writing as he taught a philosophy of writing. He okay. taught you how to approach writing um, from uh, a character-based uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, so it wasn't really, we didn't do any writing in Danny's class. We just, we, we analyzed writing and we talked about writing. And I did that briefly for like a three-month or four-month period. Um, uh, but that was actually after I had already started working as a writer. Right. Uh, well, so, I, I yeah. would say, John, it sounds like you were a and are a natural. Well, I'll tell you what I am. I'm a natural storyteller. Mm -hmm. I think I really like telling stories, and that's my particular gift, and that's something that I was really born with. Um, and in terms of writing writing, it's very funny and ironic that I've done it for all these years because I actually don't like writing. I don't mm. like sitting behind a word processor and banging out scripts. Mm -hmm. It's my least favorite thing to do. But I love telling the stories. And I love – somebody once said I don't like writing, but I love having written. Uh, <laughs> I love having written. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I love uh, seeing the things that I've, I've done. Right now I'm writing a comic book for DC. I'm writing Cyborg. That's right. And, uh, and I love it when those comic books come in the mail, when those finished comics come in the mail mm -hmm. and, and they're, you know, they're about to go on sale. Oh, mm -hmm. man, there's – I, I, today I'm going to go uh, to the mailbox because I know that issue number, I think seventeen is waiting for me. Sixteen or seventeen. I love it, and I can't wait. It's best feeling ever. Not only can you not wait, but the fans can't wait either. And in fact, I saw a picture recently, and I'm going to be talking to you about this digital age. Mm -hmm. I saw a picture of a kid holding about three <laughs> of your. Um, <laughs> magazines, your new cartoons, yeah. your covers, your your whole story, and he was very happy. Yeah, Little right. Oliver was yeah. his name. Did you happen to sign those for him? Uh, I did, I think, yes. Good for you. I believe Good that I you. did sign those. It's a great segue. How do you think that the uh, digital age is affecting the business these days? Well, I think it, I think digital is affecting our lives, mm -hmm. which uh, which is has been the topic, actually, of uh, my cyborg run. Mm. Um, uh, you know, he's he's part... Uh, digital in a way. He's part robot and part human, part cybernetic and part human. And really? so, yeah, it's given me an opportunity to investigate how digital technology and, and all the new technologies are affecting hu humanity. Is this something that they asked you to do, a direction they asked you to go in, or did you come up with this idea? It's built into the character, mm -hmm. but I think I've explored it a little bit more than uh, had been explored in, in previous incarnations of him. Mm. Um, because I think that in our lives, to get back to your question, in our lives, everything, every profession is being affected by digital. Um, I saw, I know, for instance, that um, you are one of the giants of voiceover. I saw a demo recently online where um, th they will be able, this is all technology that, that exists right now. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily on the marketplace, but mm -hmm. it'll be here in you know, the next year or two. Mm -hmm. um, they can, they'll be able to sample any of our voices, so let's say um, I, I sample you mm -hmm. for about 15 minutes mm -hmm. and have you say certain sentences, and then from that, they will be able to type in a sentence, and you will speak that sentence. Wow. Just from that, because they'll get your tone, they'll get your, in, your intonation, they'll get your nuance. Mm -hmm. They will capture all that, they'll put it into an algorithm, and they'll be able to, to create new Rodney Salisbury voiceover. 
<laughs> That's uh, scary. <laughs> it is scary, and 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 you know, and I've also seen the same in in terms of video, where they, they can shoot some footage, and then uh, capture someone's mouth, and then you you know the person that you're looking at, and it might be a historical figure, it might mm-hmm. be Winston Churchill or something, mm-hmm. and it'll look like he's speaking. So all of our lives, especially in the entertainment business, are going to be affected in one way or another, or are being affected right now mm-hmm. with all this digital technology. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that um, right now there's a tremendous amount of programming being done. Mm-hmm. And that affects, you know, how much work there is for us out there at the moment. And it affects uh, how much money we get paid for what we do. And, you know, it, 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 and it's all based on this new wave of technology that's, mm-hmm. that's coming up. People are now streaming entertainment on their Roku's and Apple TV's, mm-hmm. and, and uh, the network broadcasting system is being radically altered, and the cable system is being radically altered. So we have to stay on our feet, uh, which is not always easy because we're old men, right? <laughs> we're old. We, we That's have to, right. We have That's to stay right. nimble and live. Yes, and, we do. Uh, and on top of our profession. Yes, we do. Well, I want to ask you because this show is called Success Talks. Mm. What do you think is the formula for success? The key to success. Um, I think that some overall, um, and I talk about this when I lecture, I think that some overall things that have to be kept in mind, sort of a, a overall philosophy is that you have to stay alert. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be very specific, uh, it's really great if you kind of avoid substance abuse. Mm-hmm. So if I'm giving advice, when I'm giving advice to young people, one of the things I tell them is, if you've got a bad habit and you come out to Los Angeles to, you know, to get into the industry, your bad habit is going to get magnified a thousandfold. Mm-hmm. And it could conceivably do you in. So, you know, um, I think uh, avoiding substance abuse is really important. I think that um, staying positive is really important. Uh, it's not easy to do. I think that there's a tendency a lot of people have to accentuate the negative, and you can't do that because there's no time and there's no room for it. You just have to keep moving forward. Um, I think, interestingly enough, the pursuit of perfection can sometimes get in your way. Hmm. Uh, I don't think that this industry is necessarily about being perfect. I think this industry is more about getting it done. I love that. And yeah. a lot of people get wrapped up in perfection and they beat themselves up over it and they pursue it endlessly and never finish things. And, you know, we've all been guilty of this a little bit at one time or other. That's right. But one of the biggest lessons I learned when I got out here, um, I was working for uh, for Hanna-Barbera mm-hmm. and uh, I used to, I was working in the editorial department and I used to put together the footage after it came back from overseas uh, and you know, the, these, these shows, I remember once I was looking at a Flintstones cops, uh, Fred and Barney as cops. And, um, it came back from overseas, Korea. I think it was animated in Korea, but it could have been Australia or Japan or someplace like that. Uh, and it, w- it just looked awful. It had lots of problems and lots of flaws. And we would try to fix as much of this in the editing as we could because, Everything at H&B was very cost-oriented, and it cost money to reshoot. Mm-hmm. So if you could fix it editorially, then that would save them money. So we right. would try to fix these things. But it really just looked like a mess. Mm-hmm. And I thought, wow, they're not going to be able to get this on the air, you mm-hmm. know. And then a week later, it was on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I love and it. nothing had changed. But, right, right. you know, we it just turned out that... It wasn't about perfection. It was about getting the show on the air. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, now they make multi-million dollar movies out of all the cartoons I used to work on years ago. Mm-hmm. So obviously perfection wasn't the issue. I mean, Flintstones is just as big of a franchise now as it always has been. Isn't that so awesome? perfection wasn't the issue. It was about getting it done and getting it out there and doing the best that you can. Mm-hmm. You know, no one ever wants to have their name associated with garbage. Exactly. But you just do the best you can. I love that, John. I love that answer. I think that that is a great key to success, to not be so caught up in perfection, to get it done, let it be the best that you can do, no doubt about it. But we're not going after perfection necessarily. And the beauty of getting something done is that then it exists. That's exactly right. I mean, you know, where... 
and we're still young men, but we're old enough now to uh, to have raised the whole generation, mm-hmm. at least, of, uh, of, of people who have watched our product. Mm-hmm. And I'm always very proud. You know, I go to conventions, and, and uh, there are these um, guys that will, will sort of want to sit around with me and talk about Spider-Man, for instance. Mm-hmm. And I'm always amazed at what great guys they are and women, you know, young ladies. Um, I use the term guys generically. Right, right. <laughs> um, what great folks they are. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, we'll be sitting around a table, and they're all smart and bright and articulate, mm-hmm. and they they tell me things about the series that, you know, when I, I remember putting it into, like, an episode and thinking, oh, no one will ever notice this or get this, and they got it, and they understood it. what it, what made it interesting, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and I think, wow, I raised all these kids. That's right. You know, the programming really had an effect on them, and that mm-hmm. makes me very proud, and it makes me feel like I've contributed to society, mm-hmm. uh, you know, while, while aggressively pursuing making a buck. <laughs> and uh, it's a good feeling. It really is a good feeling. So mm-hmm. you just you do the best you can, and you, you try to do – you try to – I try not to put anything out there that is going to be negative or, um, or, you know, hurt society in any, Mm -hmm. in any way, Mm -hmm. because I have to live here. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm not interested in, in anything that's warped or twisted or crazy. Um, Mm -hmm. I, I want to put things out there that, uh, that put people in a good headspace. So. Well, it makes your legacy a wonderful one. Well, thank you. I like to think so. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, John, for being with us on success talks. And um, I want to wrap this up, uh, but I would love for you to leave our audience with something. Uh, what would you like to say to them about uh, the future and uh, how you see uh, today in terms of people reaching their goals? Well, I think that the future um, is going to be very interesting, uh, he said as an understatement. Um, I think that people have to start being a little more positive uh, in this day and age. Um, there are getting to be an awful lot of us on the planet. We're going to all have to learn how to live with one another. I think that people are, who are looking at the past and wanting things to be like the past, that never works. Mm-hmm. Nothing's ever like the past. Mm-hmm. So we have to move forward. We're living in a, a remarkable time mm-hmm. when there's a tremendous amount of, of opportunity and information and choice mm-hmm. at our fingertips. You know, I haven't always had as much choice as I would have liked. Mm-hmm. I see young people coming up today and they have a tremendous amount of choice in terms of um, what they can do with technology and what they can accomplish. I think for creators, there's never been a better time. So go out and create and create the best thing that you can and just try to make the world a better place. Um, you know, I go back to uh, the Beatles, all you need is love and and uh, Ringo and his peace and love movement. <laughs> I think we need those things now more than ever. Yes, we do. Yes, and we do. Uh, I, I'd like to... Uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to put out good product that just makes society a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I want to thank everyone out there for listening. Don't forget, you can find Success Talks, the archived calls, at rodneysalsbury.com. You can also email me at rodtalks at aol.com. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you all again on my podcast Success Talks. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rodney. This has been great. Bye-bye, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and I urge you to listen to future podcasts, where I will continue to try and make you better than before. My goal is to point you in a positive direction to success, right here on Success Talks with me, Rodney Salisbury. change my way.